Hello, dear colleagues and everyone who is interested in radio engineering. Good morning for those of you who are connected from USA and good evening for those who are from Latvia, locals. Uh, today, in the episode 3, we are going to continue exploring the propagation properties of radio waves. We already covered some of them in the previous episode, including free space loss propagation and other attenuation in the atmosphere, including atmospheric absor absorption loss and uh, absorption uh, and attenuation due to hydrometeors. Today we are going to look at the electromagnetic wave traveling principles and some imminent properties of the wave itself. Uh, but before we begin, I would like to answer the question from the previous episode concerning uh, the radio wave absorption in the atmosphere due to uh, precipitation. So the question stated the following, why do we have such a significant effect of the rain attenuation, but uh, in terms of uh, microwave attenuation, right? Uh, but almost no effect from the snow and hail, so from ice particles and snow. So the answer is that we should compare macroscopic versus microscopic levels. Uh, if we are talking about microscopic levels, then we have just attenuation due to absorption by the molecules, right? So uh, it would be indifferent whether we have snow or rain, etc. But here we are talking about the macroscopic level. So we are talking about the conglomerations of molecules of some uh, different states of matter, being the liquid state or uh, crystal solid state, for example. So the same uh, water molecules can form the crystal of ice and can form the liquid particles or uh, the raindrops. And in this case, uh, the raindrops is what absorbs the energy of microwaves, not the molecules. So if these, these molecules are constituted in the form of the raindrops, they are going to absorb this energy. They, if, they are, uh, if they make up some other structure like the crystal of ice or crystal of snow, they are not going to attenuate the signal at all because uh, the structure itself will be different. So uh, we have to take into account this macroscopic level, not microscopic level. Okay, and uh, also I'd like to show you the correct answers to the previous quiz test. So let us review these seven uh, answers shortly. The first question was, what is the isotropic radiator? And all of you answered correctly, so I'm not going to, uh, to waste time on this question exactly. This is by definition. The next question uh, concerned the wave uh, loss, uh, the electromagnetic wave uh, power loss while propagating through empty space. And some of you answered that there will be no loss. Uh, but actually the free space loss, which I am referring to here in this question, is an imminent property of wave and it is going to be present even in vacuum. So empty space, the same attenuation is going to result due to free space loss. But of course there will be no attenuation due to atmosphere or any precipitation. Uh, the next question was, uh, what is the difference between freeze and free space loss equations? And the correct answer is that both the relation between transmitted power and received power, it was upside down in both equations and gain considerations. So uh, we, we don't have any gain, an, an antenna gain uh, included in the free space loss. This is just a, a simple um, loss attribute. So both of these parameters is what makes the difference between these two equations. 
And what condition must be satisfied to apply free space loss equation? Almost all of you answered correctly. Uh, this, the main condition, the main rule is that blink distance must be much greater than the wavelength. So that we are uh, certain that we are operating in the so-called far field, not the near field, right? The next question was due, uh, about the atmospheric absorption uh, and the two components uh, that contribute to this absorption are oxygen and water vapor. So due to their molecular dimensions. And here we're talking about the molecules, not about the raindrops. And another question was about the attenuation due to atmosphere and rain. And the correct answer is that uh, the electromagnetic wave is attenuated due to power dissipation, due to absorption and scattering. So almost all of you answered correctly. The last question was a little bit confusing as well for you. And uh, it turned out that 60 gigahertz is affected more than 80 gigahertz, which is counterintuitive because it is lower frequency. However, uh, there was a dry air notion in the question, which means that we don't have any water vapor uh, or we don't have any precipitation going on. Uh, that leave us just with the oxygen molecules, which are going to absorb the power of the radio wave. And as we learned in our previous episode, 60 gigahertz resonate with these molecules of oxygen. And thus these molecules absorb more energy at this particular frequency. That is why in the dry atmosphere, 60 gigahertz is going to be attenuated less. All right. So now let us start with the presentation. And we are continuing the subject of propagation properties of radio signals. But let me ask you first, uh, as a starting point of our discussion, how does the wave propagate? And this picture which you see is going to serve you as a hint. And let me maybe ask more specifically, what natural phenomenon do you see in this picture? And this phenomenon partially explains how does the wave propagate. So please, I'm waiting for your suggestions, for your options. What do you think about it? We can observe this very beautiful view while being on the beach in the, during the sunset, sunrise, whatever it is. But uh, what is it from the physics point of view? What does it represent? And how does it relate to the wave propagation? Okay, three correct answers in a row. <clears throat> And that's correct. This is the representation of diffraction. When the sunlight, in this case, is obstructed, uh, the, the, the source of sunlight is obstructed by a cloud, but the light itself is getting through. We can see these rays around the cloud, and we can still uh, perceive uh, the light. And nevertheless, it is blocked. So we're going to see today how is it possible, how light and any other electromagnetic wave gets over the obstacle and uh, what mechanism uh, allows it to do so. And this man partially answered this question back in the 17th century. So he laid the basis for fully answering this question and fully, full answer to this question was uh, given more than one, uh, more than a century later. But uh, this man laid the basis for this and we cannot underestimate this basis. His name is Christian Huygens. He lived in 17th century. And uh, 
he made first steps in understanding the nature of the waves and of the wave propagation, namely the light propagation and any other electromagnetic wave as well. But, uh, so let us uh, take a look at this personality and uh, check for what he is famous also. So he is a Dutch mathematician, physicist, astronomer and inventor. <clears throat> uh, again, a question to you, maybe somebody from you knows for which invention is he famous? So what did he invent? and uh, which invention uh, made his name famous back in those days. Do you know? Quite a specific question, but maybe some of you have heard anything about him, because he was uh, not only a physicist, but also inventor and a major figure in the scientific revolution uh, at all. Okay, no options, then I'm going to show you. Uh, first of all, he improved the design of telescopes and also he invented the pendulum clock. So it was a breakthrough in timekeeping back in, the, in those days. And his uh, clock was the most accurate timekeeper for almost 300 years after this invention. So quite an important invention. Yes. Micro ah, okay, I, I haven't noticed. Uh, Anton suggested microscope, Christophs suggested telescope, and Christophs was closer to the answer. Yes, he improved the design of telescopes. That's correct. And also the pendulum clock was his invention. Uh, but for us, he's in interesting uh, concerning the physics, phys physics itself. And uh, he is best known for his work in the wave theory of light. He proposed this theory in 1678. And uh, since then we call it a Huygens principle, which posits that the light is radiating wave fronts uh, and explains propagation of these wave fronts as a result of spherical waves being emitted at every point along the wave front. This, uh, of course, sounds a bit complicated, but I'm going to show you this in an example, and we are going to take a look at the schematics of how this principle uh, can be uh, explained in simple terms. And also, he uh, suggested that the nature of light is a longitudinal longitudinal wave. Um, so the main principle here to represent the light as the radiating wave fronts and every point of this wave front emitting its own uh, ray, its own uh, wave and the spherical wave around this uh, wave front forms a new wave front at each time instance. In instance. Uh, so this principle basically forms uh, explanation of a longitudinal wave, right? Um, the fun fact is that nevertheless this was the major scientific breakthrough at those days. Uh, his, th his theory still assumed an omnipresent ether. So the scientist uh, at that time believed that there is an omnipresent ether, all-pervading substance, uh, invisible substance, uh, which explained for them the propagation of light. So nevertheless his theory laid the basis for correct understanding of light and of, of propagation of light. Still he assumed this, this ether. Uh, these perfectly elast elastic invisible particles all over the space, right? Filling all the space. So that's quite funny that he presumed this uh, together with this theory of light, which was in this basis correct theory. Uh, from our perspective, uh, the modern knowledge perspective. However, still, still he had some 
false assumption about this, uh, the nature of, 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 uh, of the matter. And uh, also it's worth mentioning that his theory of light was rejected in favor of Newton's corpuscular theory of light uh, back in those days. So the Newton's corpuscular theory of light was, was the dominant theory and his, the, the theory of Christian Huygens was rejected. And this was true until another personality came to stage, uh, Augustine Jean Fresnel, which we will, we, we will discuss this uh, scientist later. But he adopted Huygens' principle in his work and then he proved uh, he proved the propagation of light as an electro electromagnetic wave and he defeated the Newton's corpuscle theory completely. But it happened more than a century later. Uh, so for now let's concentrate on Huygens principle and then we'll back to the Huygens Fresnel principle which is a combination of both works of Huygens and Fresnel. Okay, so the same question, how does the wave propagate? And now we see the physical representation of the wave, of the water wave on the surface of water. Um, due to the fact that this is, is still a wave, not electromagnetic wave, but still a wave. So in this wave shares some properties with the electromagnetic wave. And we can use it as a visual example, quite a simple visual example. And we can see uh, that the primary front, wave front, going outwards uh, from, from the center of, uh, let's say, radiation, uh, marked in green, right? And this front, at some instance of time, forms another sources of secondary radiation. And these sources of secondary oscillations is called wavelets. These wavelets produce another fronts of radiation themselves. They are uh, shown in this yellow and red in this picture. And together combined these secondary radiating sources or wavelets form the next uh, position of our overall wavefront. And we can see that the second uh, green line, second green water uh, wave front is expanding. So uh, the second wave front is being produced. And now we have another one at another instance of time. And thus it goes on and on. And each new point on this new wave front becomes uh, the, the, the radiating source of secondary radiation becomes a wavelet and radiates a spherical wave around it and forms another, uh, another wave front. And thus, this, this wave fronts continue on and on. This is how it looks schematically. Uh, so on the left we can see the spherical wave front propagation. We have a common center in the middle of radiation. And then at some point of time uh, we draw imaginary line and we designate the wave front by this line. And we can see this A, B, C, D, E small letters. These are the points of the secondary uh, radiation sources. These are spherical wave front. And each of these sources emits a wavelet. And then these wavelets all together combined form uh, again, the wave front, but further from the source and uh, in, in the next instance of time. And this wave front is marked by capital A, B, C, D, E letters. And, and uh, in this manner it goes on and on. Uh, a question from Christophs. Why does the red backwards radiation does not manifest itself, but we see only outward wave, waves overall? 
Uh, well, that's a good question. And uh, my present assumption is that the backwards, spherical wave radiated backwards, uh, cancel out. Uh, I'll have to find for some scientific explanation of this and some theoretical explanation. But for me, the most evident uh, explanation for this now that this backwards uh, motion superimpose in the manner of cancelling out and uh, that is why we, we don't have any uh, let's say uh, cancelling effect of the primary source right so so we have the propagating way further further on we don't have this uh, attenuated primary source so this is my first guess and I will surely try to find more mathematical, more uh, physical uh, explanation of this, but this uh, seems uh, more or less explanatory. And now, of, co of course, uh, additionally you have another schematic on the right, which shows the plane wave front, but the principle the same. Just the wavelets form this straight line comparing to the spherical uh, outward wave fronts. Um, okay, now let's place this principle in the context of the radio communication. Let's form a link between A and B, between the transmitter and the receiver. Uh, after all, we are dealing with the radio engineering, with the microwaves, right? So we are not interested in merely the light propagation or the water wave propagation. Uh, we are interested in the radio wave propagation between the source and the receiver. So let's imagine this uh, radio wave link, radio communica communication link from A to B. And it turns out that the total energy of the received signal level is accumulated as the sum of all the multi multitude of tiny wavelets along all these fronts expanding from the primary source. So the main idea is that uh, the radio wave energy is not propagating as the pencil thin beam in the middle just between uh, the points A and B. It propagates as the whole set of different sources along the along the wave front. So wave front expands and it produces another secondary uh, sources of radiation. And all this rays of energy, all these secondary waves, uh, superimpose at the receiver side. So they they can add up, they can subtract. We will get to this later, but the main point is that all these uh, secondary radiating sources of the axis, not on the axis, but of the axis, they contribute to the received energy, received field energy at the receiver point, at the B point. And uh, of course, uh, obviously in the practical sense, at a certain distance from the axis, this contribution is negligible, right? Uh, so, but we'll have to take into account this to a certain extent, to a certain distance, and we will see. Uh, this concept uh, lays the basis for explaining the Fresnel zones, by the way. And uh, we also have to take into account uh, that there is a phase delay between this primary signal, let's call it this a primary signal between A and B, and this secondary signals. Um, this phase delay is what defines adding up or cancelling uh, the total signal at the receiver. And this, how, this is what defines the Fresnel zones themselves. And this is what uh, ties up such concepts as diffraction, multipath, interference together. 
So more or less, these are all the same uh, concept, but the application of this concept can be different, and we will see why. So now we are getting closer to understanding the Fresnel zone concept, and therefore let's talk about the scientist whom the Fresnel zones own their name. The scientist is Augustin Jean Fresnel, who was a French civil engineer and physicist, and uh, whose research in optics led to the some very significant uh, breakthrough in the wave theory of light. But he also was an inventor, like uh, Christian Huygens. And he is known for inventing the catadioptric Fresnel lens, which was called the invention that saved a million ships. So now a question to you. Maybe you know, maybe you can deduce what could be this invention that saved a million ships and million lives. What do you think? What is this lens that he invented? Because he was... Uh, primarily working in the field of optics. And he also invented something, not just uh, the theoretical work was uh, famous. So what do you think, please? I'm waiting for your suggestions. I will definitely show you. I guess that it is beam forming lens for lighthouses. Lighthouse. Okay. Uh, some mention lighthouses. And uh, well, that's correct. But why is this invention saved the million ships? So what was uh, the improvement? How, how did he improve this? lighthouses, construction, or, or, or anything else, from the point of view of optics. So, some little bit of more explanation is required here to understand. Well, maybe this picture can tell you something. Uh, this is the so-called stepped lens who was uh, designed to extend the visibility of lighthouses. So this invention helped to increase the magnitude of the light uh, intensity coming out from the lighthouses. Yes, that's correct. Uh, that it focused the, be the, the beam and it, so it could be seen further and uh, appeared brighter to the ships. Yes, that's correct. And you can see why this step lens uh, produces this parallel rays of light and uh, thus it, it, it helped to concentrate light as a single beam. And the lighthouses uh, uh, became more efficient and could be seen further. And that, that is why uh, it was more safer now to, to, uh, to for the sailors. Okay. Now let's get back to Fresnel and to his work in the field of optics. So his research in optics led to the almost anonymous acceptance of the wave theory of light. So this uh, completely defeated the Newton's corpuscular theory. Uh, but he based his work on the work of Christian Huygens. And now we, we can uh, name this overall principle as the Huygens-Fresnel principle. Because he used it in order to uh, make up his own work. Uh, so, what, what, what did he do exactly? He supposed that the light waves are purely tra trans transverse. Uh, in contrast to Huygens, who suggested that the light, uh, the light uh, wave is uh, longitudinal. 
So by assuming that the wave is purely transverse, as we learned in our first episode, that it is TEM type, so uh, transverse electric and magnetic field, by assuming this, he could explain the nature of polarization. So why the light becomes polarized at all, right? So we, we already know that polarization depends on the uh, orientation of electrical field. And uh, by assuming this transverse nature of light beam, he could explain the polarization itself. Yes, that's a very good uh, comment from Kristaps, that the Karpovskol theory came back for vengeance in the 20th century. That's correct, yes. That was uh, the missing point, after all. So <laughs> we, we started with Karpovskol theory, uh, then we turned to the wave theory, and then we understood that the wave is not uh, merely wave, but also a particle. So this dualism actually explained it all. After, uh, after, uh, after some more research researches in the quantum physics. So yes, actually we came back to, to this notion, but uh, we explained it in other terms. And, uh, but that's very good uh, comment, yes, very interesting. And actually this explanation von Fresnel is very important for us. And this is very important for understanding the diffraction and uh, the rectilinear propagation of the wave. So until for now, uh, this concept wasn't clear enough. Uh, why do light propagate in a linear form, uh, like in straight line? So he gave this satisfactory explanation of diffraction and of the rectilinear propagation. Now let, let us talk about the concept of the Fresnel zones. Again, the same question, how does the wave propagate? And you can see here the schematic depiction of the Fresnel zone. Uh, from now we again going, getting to these uh, essentially radio wave, radio engineering point of view. So we are uh, uh, assuming the radio link between two antennas, between two points, like uh, we you can see here. And you can see this large ellipsoid, ellipsoidal form Fresnel zone. This is the first Fresnel zone, let's say. And this is how it looks like. And one have, has to understand that this concept of the Fresnel zones is purely artificial. There are no any fields in the form of Fresnel zones. There are no any specific boundaries for signal propagation. This is just for us, just how do we perceive uh, this diffraction principle. And uh, basically this is what it is. Uh, we don't posit that there is a, any special room for wave propagation or any limits. Uh, there are no limits, right? These are just some imaginary concept which just helps us to uh, explain the diffraction phenomenon. And this formula allows us to find out the radius of the Fresnel zone by using the distance and uh, using the frequency. So we have to take into account that the Fresnel zones uh, depend also on the properties of the wave to be transmitted and on the frequency of this wave and also depends on the link distance. Uh, which uh, is used for this uh, radio link. So let me elaborate on this and uh, before we understand this picture which I uh, will show you on the right of the slide, I'm going to get to the board and try to explain you the concept of the Fresnel zones. So, let us draw the same radio link here, like we've seen in the slide. 
with a line of sight propagation. This will be the direct beam. And we assume that there is a, let's say, first frenal zone around this. So why do we care about this frenal zone, about this large space around the line of sight? Why to care about it at all? So what do we have there? It turns out that we have uh, previously stated that the, our overall received signal level here, the strength of the field here, will be dependent not only on this line of sight, propagation path, but also all the secondary wavelets, secondary uh, wave fronts will contribute to this power. And we have a multitude of them, an infinite number of them. Let's see. Uh, let's take a wave front somewhere here in this instant of time. Uh, the radio wave propagates and uh, we just define the wave front to be here, right? And we take some uh, point on this wave front, which becomes a source for secondary radiation, which becomes a wavelet. And we also obtain the secondary signal here, which travels a different path than the primary signal. But it also adds up here, so it forms the overall signal. The same can be uh, set about any point on this line. And there are infinite number of these points. And also any wavefront which will be present at any further instance of time, right? So we're also going to receive further these secondary waves here. And uh, it turns out, okay, another Another point which I have to mention is that, uh, as, I, as I mentioned already, very important is to take into account the phase shift. So we understand that this path lens is different from those path lens. And the difference will be, uh, can be characterized by either a wave lens or a phase shift. So all these signals will be received here with a certain phase shift. Uh, let's say that our primary signal, let's simplify it to a sine wave. Let me draw a full period of this sine wave, right? So here's the time. And uh, this is our main, main, uh, this is our main signal. And all the secondary signals will be slightly delayed. Some, let's say, delta phi, delta phase, right? Uh, for example, it will be slightly delayed. So let's draw it here. Like this. And uh, it could be delayed further. It could be laid here, and uh, these are multitudes of this wave, which sums up here. And it turns out that if we get to the border of the Fresnel zones, how do we define the Fresnel zones? We define the Fresnel zones with this artificial boundary, and the signal, the secondary wavelet, which is going from here to the receiver, is going to be delayed by the half a wavelength. So this will be our difference between the primary signal and the secondary signal. And half a wavelength looks like this. If we delay it by the lambda divided by two, then we obtain something like this. And also we have to understand that all superposition of these waves is actually interfering. So there are multiple waves interfering with each other, right? So they sum up either constructively or destructively. They can uh, increase the final power or they can cancel each other. In this case, they will cancel. 
you can see the first wave is here, the second is quite opposite, just opposite. So they will cancel each other and the result will be none, zero power. Uh, then, if we go to the second Fresnel zone, the second Fresnel zone is all around the first one, but it excludes the first Fresnel zone. So this is the space between the boundary and of the first and of the second, so three-dimensional space. The same happens here. We have a multitude of wavelengths inside this zone, and each of them contributes to the overall signal as well. And here, in the boundary, in the boundary, uh, we have another condition, fixed condition, and this will be, this will be uh, a full wavelength shift comparing to the main signal. So if we draw this here, then we will get something like this. It will fully coincide with the primary signal. And then that means this will constructively add. See, this is constructive interference. These two signals will add together. They will, as a result, increase our signal, right? Not canceling it, like, like here on this border condition, but will increase it. And it goes up to infinity. So again, we have the third signal, and we have uh, the third final zone, which will be delayed by 3 lambda divided by 2, and then we will have uh, the fourth, which will be delayed by 2 lambda, and so on. And these Fresnel zones go up to infinity. And uh, what we get, the question is what we get here after all this multiple multitude of wavelets are combined together. What do we get in the end? We get almost uh, almost nothing. So they will cancel each other, they will compensate. All those which cancel will be compensate, compensated by all those which will add up. So we will have almost no effect at all if we assume the infinite number of Fresnel zones. And our signal will be is what we expect uh, by solving the free space loss equation. Let's say this is somewhere in space and we, we just uh, f found out uh, which signal we are going to receive here, given the free space loss. And after all this uh, adding up and subtractions, we receive the same signal as we calculated, right? So this, this, all, all this wavelets compensate. But what is important, that if we uh, assume any obstacle inside of these zones, this will tremendously affect our signal. This is what uh, will make it unbalanced. This is will bring in balance in this uh, whole system. And let me show how it is going to affect us. Uh, maybe some of you already know this concept of the first Fresnel zone clearance, which is popular in microwave. So the question is why do we have to maintain the first Fresnel zone clearance? Also we are talking about 60% of the first Fresnel zone clearance, right? This is very popular in the link planners uh, circles. Actually, these are 57%, right? But <laughs> for simplicity, it is round up to, to 60%. Uh, but this is the minimum clearance at which we do not sacrifice our signal power. If we have the 60% of first Fresnel zone clear from obstructions, then we will obtain what do we expect, what do we calculate. There will be no such so-called diffraction loss. And uh, if the obstruction uh, impinges the Fresnel zone more than 60%, then there will be additional loss due to diffraction. And this is called diffraction loss. Okay. Uh, 
for, for now, let us assume the first Fresnel zone clearance. Not 60%, but just the first. So we've got uh, the first Fresnel zone here, if we remember. And let's assume that these antennas are not infinitely high, but they are some over some terrain. And this terrain uh, ends here, for example on the border of the first Fresnel zone. Here is where we have our terrain. So the first Fresnel zone is clear. Now, what do you think? We've got all these uh, secondary waves adding up here, either constructively or destructively, up to this boundary point. Which is going to be delayed by half a wavelength, as we learn. What does it mean? It means that we will have either a, a half a wave, half wave delay, or less than half wave delay. So why are we, uh, why uh, do we want to preserve the first Fresnel zone clearance if the final point here, the reflections from the ground, actually are going to contribute as well? So here we got the secondary uh, wavelets, right? But there will be, if there is a actually terrain, then we will receive these reflections. And these reflections are going to add up, which is called multipath. We will cover this in one of the next episodes. So what do you think? Why, if the overall effect of this clearance is negative from the first uh, side, this will cancel out the main signal. And all the signals be before, of course, there are a lot of them. But uh, intuitively, they will contribute to signal attenuation not to signal uh, amplification, right? So why do we want this? Why do we want to preserve the first Fresnel zone clearance, not the second one? Because the second one is delayed by the whole wavelength and whole wavelength would give us the positive contribution. So then it would be required to, to preserve the second Fresnel zone clearance. Any options? So far, no thoughts. Uh, I will give you a minute to, to, to find out, to maybe to think about this concept, because this is very important. In the real microwave world, we're dealing with this uh, first, second, third Fresnel zone clearances, right? Because we, we don't want to, to put the antennas too high, especially for the low frequencies, where Fresnel zones are huge, uh, because as I mentioned, Fresnel zone radius is dependent on the frequency. The lower the frequency, the larger are the dimensions of Fresnel zone. And we want to maintain the tower heights not so big, as less as possible, as small as possible, to save our money. And still, we want this condition to be fulfilled in order to have acceptable performance of our signal. So we are really interested in this, of how much clearance should we allow? Infinite clearance, or let's say the second Fresnel zone clearance, the third, the fourth, which one? Yes, Egils is right. Uh, he wrote the shift phase, uh, phase shift matters. And uh, let me elaborate on this. What does he mean by this? Actually here, what happens here? If we don't have any terrain, then this condition is applied, half a wave delay from this point of view, right? Somewhere in space. If we introduce some obstruction, we introduce some earth terrain, then electromagnetic wave hitting this terrain is going to invert its face by 180 degrees. And this is what makes a difference. Here, 
the signal will be inverted by half a wave, which is going to flip this signal upside down. And we are going to amplify our overall signal, not cancel out. That is why we want the first Fresnel zone clearance here. Because then, while reflected, being reflected, so the thing is that the electromagnetic wave being reflected from the another medium with which is optically more dense. So it's going from, let's say, atmosphere, from the air, from the earth atmosphere to the terrain. And this, uh, the second, uh, the second medium is more optically dense than the first. And this is the condition for phase shift. Then th this phase will be shifted. So that's the answer. And if we would have the second Fresnel zone clearance, the situation would be uh, inverted. This, uh, this uh, whole wave concept would be inverted. This would be shifted by 180 degrees and we, will, we would cancel out our signal. So if we would maintain the clearance of the second Fresnel zone and we would put the Earth under the uh, second Fresnel zone, that we would have degraded signal. The signal would be smaller. Uh, the overall contribution of these reflections would cancel out our signal. Uh, that is why we want to preserve the first Fresnel zone clear from obstructions. And it turns out that if we preserve the first Fresnel zone clearance, that our signal would be even higher than we would expect in the infinitely empty space. It would be by six decibels uh, stronger. So this is not only uh, what uh, allows us to to get rid of diffraction loss, but also to amplify our signal. But to get the signal as it is, like to get no amplification, no uh, attenuation, we would maintain the 60%, right? At this point, we would get what we expect from the equations. Okay, and now let's get back to the presentation. Here's what we see, the same concept we can see here on the slide, on the right, right? So you can see the boundary of the first Fresnel zone, uh, which is delayed by half a wavelength, and the boundary of the second Fresnel zone, which is delayed by a whole wavelength. <coughs> and goes on and on, on and on. Uh, but we don't introduce any terrain here, so that is why the phase is not inverted. Uh, all right. After uh, observing this example, we can conclude that diffraction and interference are closely related phenomenon. What you see here is the superposition of two waves together and the resulting waves beneath them. This is called interference in general terms, right? But we can see that diffraction phenomenon can be explained by interference, by the multitude of interference cases. And this is an interesting observation. And this is what is going to play a significant role in the explaining multipath phenomenon. Uh, we are going to get to, 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 to touch this in one of the next episodes. And uh, with regard to the wave superposition, the famous American theoretical physicist Richard Feynman wrote, quote, quote, no one has ever been able to define the difference between interference and diffraction satisfactory. It is just a question of usage, and there is no specific important physical difference between them. The best we can do roughly speaking, is to say that when there, is, there are only a few sources, say two, interfering, 
then the result is usually called interference. But if there is a large number of them, it seems that the word diffraction is more often used. So this is, uh, to me, a very good explanation and representation of the relation between these terms and of the difference between them as well. We are talking about diffraction, but we cannot explain diffraction without referring to uh, interference. And uh, it turns out that diffraction is a, just a case of interference with the multiple uh, interfering signals, which add up together. Okay. And now the final... Uh, the final... Uh, summing up the final slide, which will uh, just sum up all this knowledge obtained today. And this diagram is very good for explaining uh, the clearance problem of the microwaves uh, relating to the Fresnel zones and to the clearance and to the multipath and the reflections. Uh, this, this diagram is quite complicated, but it's very important to understand it in order to understand these relations. So let's see, uh, l let's review the first case of infinite number of Fresnel zones. Uh, and this would be the result of the radio link, which is infinitely high above the train, so somewhere in space. Let's say this is a communication between two satellites. Let's imagine it like this. And then we, we, we go. Fresnel zone number one, number two, and up to infinity. What do we have here? Uh, as I told you, the overall contribution of all these Fresnel zones will be uh, zero. So we will expect, we, we will get what we expect from the Fresnel uh, free space loss equation. There will be no any adding to the signal or subtracting from the signal. So we will get what we expect. Uh, this would be in the ideal case somewhere in space. But we, ha we, we are here on Earth. We are communicating above the horizon, above the terrain. So we have to include into account, take into account this terrain. And let's say we have the second Fresnel zone clearance, like shown here. Uh, what do we see on this diagram? Let me turn on the laser pointer, and uh, we can see that on the left, on this y-axis, -X we have the decibels from the free space loss. So zero would be here, there will be no change in the signal, it will be zero. Amplification will be above this line and attenuation below this line. And we have this uh, periodical uh, fluctuations of our main signal depending on the clearance. And here on the x-axis we have the clearance itself. One means that we have just the first Fresnel zone clearance. <coughs> Two would mean that we have just the second Fresnel zone clearance. And all the states in between. One and a half, sixty percent, zero. Uh, we can perceive it like this. So, we find this point here, where we have the second Fresnel zone clearance, and we see that this attenuation goes down to minus 40 dB. So, our signal is uh, very significantly attenuated at this point. Well, this is because of the uh, concept shown before, because of this contribution of the uh, reflections. Uh, the Earth is going to reflect uh, the secondary wave from the boundary of the second Fresnel zone and they are going to cancel out our primary uh, wave. That is why such a big uh, notch here. In contrast, if we uh, preserve the clearance of the first Fresnel zone only, then we get to this one and we see that our signal is not only preserved, but also amplified. And it is amplified uh, by roughly 6 dB, which is very good for us, beneficial, right? This is because of the constructive interference of the uh, reflected signal. 
from the boundary of the fir first frenal zone. And now we also notice that our 60% is somewhere here. We can see 0 0.5 and 0 0.6 somewhere here. And we get a 0 here, 0 dB, not attenuated, not uh, amplified. So this point is the middle point, right? So this is the balance, where it is balanced out. So we have just uh, uh, what we need. We, we preserve the 60% uh, clearance of the first frenal zone and we obtain the signal that we assumed by the equations. Also, you could notice that we have not just the one graph, not just the one curve here, but three of them. Uh, actually, there uh, could be drawn infinite number of them, but we will explain it uh, as in, in, on an example of three. The first one, which is marked as r equal to minus one. This is so-called smooth earth abstraction, which can be seen on screen. Uh, we can assume this type of abstraction if we are shooting over the water body. So if we are above the sea, above the lake, if there is a, a body of water between the receiver and the transmitter, and if, if this smooth surface reflects the signal perfectly, <coughs> or almost perfectly. Well, here's the idealized case uh, where the reflection coefficient is equal to 100%. It means that uh, this is the surface which perfectly reflects all the, uh, all the waves all the secondary waves. And in this case, the effect of the Fresnel zone clearance is the most significant. In this case, we can see that we have this maximum 6 dB of, of, of amplification and this maximum notches of minus 40 roughly decibels. So this graph is going to show us what is going to be if we would shoot over the water and if we would uh, maintain different clearances. That is why especially uh, multipath is so dangerous about the water, right? Because the water is perfectly reflecting uh, type of terrain, uh, type of, of obstruction. And that is why if we preserve um, the incorrect clearance, let's say the clearance of the second final zone, then it could result in very significant uh, attenuation of our overall signal. Another example is this tree in the middle. This is called knife edge abstraction. And we assume that the reflection coefficient is zero because uh, when a single point, like a very sharp uh, knife or something else like uh, like a screen which blocks the part of the frenal zones. We assume that the, there are no reflections from this tiny uh, point and this just blocks all the subsequent frenal zones but it doesn't produce any reflections. So we assume the reflection coefficient is zero and this is depicted by the curve named R equals zero. And we can see that effect from such an uh, from different uh, cases of abstraction is not so significant. It's almost zero. Well, it oscillates a bit around this zero uh, line, zero decibels line, but it doesn't contribute too much. So in this case, it doesn't make any difference for us if we uh, clear out the first frenal zone, the second one. The main point is to maintain this 60% of clearance, right? And then at the minimum. And then if even we get the second frenal zone clearance, that it is going to attenuate a bit, but not so much, not so, not so significant. However, in the real life, we have something in the middle. We always have something in the middle not perfectly reflecting, nor uh, 
perfectly not reflecting. So something in between 0 and 100% of the reflection coefficient. And this is a typical real obstruction, like some roof of a building, for example, or anything else. Here, uh, this is depicted as an example of r equal minus 0 0.3. And this is some intermediate case, right? And we have some uh, amplification if the first Fresnel zone clearance is preserved, we have some attenuation, some notches, if the second, and so on. Uh, all these uh, odd Fresnel zones clearances are going to add up to our signal, and the clearance of the even Fresnel zones, second, fourth, sixth, eighth, etc., are going to uh, attenuate our signal, to cancel our signal. And you can see that this pattern uh, is not periodically equal, so the period becomes smaller and smaller, that means that the Fresnel zone radius uh, increase becomes smaller with each, uh, is, uh, with each next Fresnel zone. So they are not all the, uh, have, have equal radius around the line of sight. They're going, the, this uh, radius are going to be decreased with every new Fresnel zone. And right, here is our sweet point of 60% or 57% to, pre uh, to be precise, where all of these graphs coincide and is marked at the zero point. This is our minimum clearance uh, condition very significant among the radio engineers and uh, radi uh, l l link uh, calculation planners. Well, this slide summarizes the diffraction notion that we uh, explored today. I hope it was clear more or less and I hope it was interesting. Now I'm waiting for some of your questions that may uh, may be present at this point of presentation that uh, maybe you didn't have time to ask before and uh, if no such questions uh, at the moment then surely you can post them afterwards and I will take a look but if there is nothing more to ask about then I would like to ask you and to ask you to Test your knowledge with our control quiz, which can be found in the de description of this video. So please welcome, test your knowledge. If no more questions from your side, then thank you very much for your attention, for watching us today. See you on next Wednesday.